everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am here with Vikram. Vikram, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you, Mr. Gabriel. How um, are you? I'm really, I'm really excited because this is a, this is actually something that I might actually be needing. Uh, it's it's Pictory. It's basically, it, it helps creators create video content. But before we get into Pictory, Vikram, I would love for you to introduce yourself. In fact, you mentioned you're up in the Seattle area today. So give us a little background. Who is Vikram? Absolutely. So um, I've been in Seattle for many years, over 30 years now. Uh, and I came here as a grad student at the University of Washington, beautiful UW campus where you can see Mount Rainier on a day like this. Um, I have been working here for a few years. Most people assume it's Microsoft or Amazon, but it's not. I've never worked at those two companies. Um, and uh, and then I've been an entrepreneur for over 20 years now. Uh, and uh, this is, I'm on my second company, third company, depending on how you count. Uh, but uh, my the first company, the last, the company where I had uh, the, the most success was a company called Wind Shuttle. It was in the enterprise uh, software business. And, uh, and we built that, we scaled it to about 350 employees, uh, sold that a few years ago, and then started uh, Pictory. So yeah, Seattle based serial entrepreneur, and uh, with a beautiful wife and two grown kids all of us it. went to UW there you go there you go now what what did you take when you were going to UW because it sounds like you're doing a lot of like software tech stuff currently I am yes uh so I was doing biomedical engineering at UW uh so I've always been fascinated by engineering and kind of its application to life sciences and and uh uh, and so I did my PhD in in biomedical engineering, and and some of my jobs were in that in that area. But then, everything is software. Everything in the last twenty years has moved to software. So, so it was just a natural progression. Yes. Yeah, speaking of that, you know, let's talk about your your first company, the the natural progression. How did you actually scale it to being you know one? In fact, last night I was at the Oregon and uh, the Oregon Entrepreneurship Network event uh, award ceremony. And you know these a lot of these businesses start out with one entrepreneur. How did you get it up to three hundred and fifty employees? Yeah, so it was um, a lot of luck, <laughs> but but uh, a lot of grit as well. And uh, and one thing I learned in the process was actually having a co-founder really helps. Having a co-founding team really helps. So I had two co-founders, and uh, and the thing I. I heard this somewhere and I just have adopted it. You need a hacker, a hustler, and a visionary. If you have those three people, sometimes it's rare, but sometimes it's it's you can find all those three skills in one person, but often you need at least two or three different people who bring those skill sets. So that was the first thing. The second thing was um, we took a... A kind of bootstrap mentality in the very beginning is like you know we're gonna put our own money and and try to try to grow the business as much as possible as as, as opposed to going trying to raise VC uh, money. So we had fortunately a product that was able to find the product market fit very quickly, and uh, and we were able to find the customers uh, and the customers were willing to spend money and we were able to discover that very very early, very early on, and then after that scaling was just a matter of okay making sure we are investing strategically all the revenues we're getting and uh, and we bootstrapped it. So pretty much like, no, we were not taking salaries. We're just like putting everything into the business, adding salespeople, adding engineers, adding everything that we could. And then we we grew that to about $5 million uh, in about five, six years, in run, $5 million run rate. Um, and then we got some outside capital, uh, some VCs. Because uh, once you are... Once you're at that size and you're somewhat profitable, you get a whole set of VCs approaching you, wanting to give you money as opposed to you going and making the rounds. And uh, and so we got we got a VC at that stage, and uh, and then it was just like we had capital, we were able to hire really good talent and uh, and grow the the company. And the market again, the market was great. It was enterprise, big soft big big companies like. Nike in Portland and and we had Starbucks here in Seattle and Microsoft. So all these were our customers. They all were yet running SAP and they all had the nice thing about enterprise software is you can actually 
once you're in there, it's very sticky. You, they're not going to let go of you. And then, then there was an expansion phase. So every customer would expand and, and buy more software. So yeah, I, there's no formula. It's, it's, yeah, it's, no. Uh, it's luck. And you know, I'd, I'd love for you to explain, you know, you, you mentioned enterprise network, right? It's, explain it to the listeners what that means. So enterprise, the way I see market types, you could you could sell to consumers. You and I, we, we sell, we buy iPhones, we buy all kinds of uh, products. Then you could sell to, uh, I, I call them prosumers. They're like, you know, individuals trying to create businesses uh so solopreneurs and and really small uh companies uh and like the the kinds you mentioned that you met at, at your conference a lot right. of yep. solo entrepreneurs um then you have small businesses that could be you know maybe now you've scaled it up to say five people up to up to a few hundred people uh, employees and then when you get like then you have mid-size and then enterprises are the largest companies out there so they're like, you know, 5,000 employees or more. And uh, and some of the biggest brands that we all, you and I all know, they're all, I call them the enterprises, <laughs> they're large companies. And uh, that's the enterprise market. You're going to sell it, it. It's a whole different process selling to them, servicing them uh, and the way the, the way the product needs to work. It's just, it's just, it's, it's very different. How would you define like what, how is it different than like an individual software? Cause an enterprise is huge, right? So folks, we're talking like the Nikes, the Boeings, right? The large organizations of the world. So you're trying to basically do the same thing you would be doing for individual, but on scale of 5,000 to 10,000 employees. So think about rolling out some software. How difficult is that? So it's difficult in many different ways. One, the problems are very different. So you have to know the problems that you're trying to address something that you're Solving for individuals uh, may or may not exist in the in in a big organization, or there may be very different problems that that you don't even think about. Like the the the, the product that we had built was based on top of a product called SAP. So a lot of these large companies run SAP as their accounting system, and and now consumers don't run SAP. We we run. Um, Quicken or something if we're lucky <laughs> to keep track of our finances, but but businesses have to keep track of their finances. So SAP is kind of the big database that everything is tracked in. Now, for people who use SAP, they have a lot of problems getting data in and out of SAP. So so we discovered some of those problems that that we could build a product that solves that, and uh, and so that's like so so the problems are different then the solutions are different and the solutions have to scale. They have to respect all the security concerns that people have. They have to, they have to be able to, you know, run in thousand person organization and, and not disrupt anything. Uh, they have to, uh, and, and of course that's, that's the problem, the solution. And then of course, how you sell to them is very different. It, they expect there to be a salespeople, if you're selling to consumers, you 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 generally don't expect to so talk to a salesperson. Um, so th this everything is different selling to larger companies. Yeah, you know, and I, I must admit, you know, working in the healthcare industry, you know, I I work with you know larger organizations, and so this the best way I can kind of uh, explain this as what you're kind of dealing with from the healthcare perspective is like all the different hospitals we have, each one has a different EMR, uh, electronic medical record system. None of those talk to each other. Right. And then each one of your radiology, you know, imaging departments, they have their own systems. None of those talk to each other. Right. In fact, I'm going to a dinner in a couple of weeks here in Oregon uh, with a with the former CEO of Cambia to talk about what are what technologies are out there to kind of help bridge that communication gap because it's so needed. It shouldn't matter if you go to, you know, get care here in Oregon or care in New York. Everybody should have access to your medical records, especially when they need, well, not everyone, but the providers, right? The individuals that need access to that information. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like you're bridging that gap. Yeah. And that's, I mean, this is what we were doing for larger companies uh, is, is kind of this uh, gap. And, and in our case, the, what we found was Excel was commonplace. 
So everybody was using oh, I Excel. Love Excel. <laughs> so I love Excel. So, yeah, I mean, so people would send a customer, sometimes would send an order to Kellogg's. Kellogg's was one of our customers. They had a lot of mom and pop stores as their uh, suppliers. They would send the orders to Kellogg and in Excel sheets. And then they had like poor people entering all that into SAP. And, and we just automated that whole process. Uh, and uh, and I, I, healthcare is full of things like that. I mean, I... I know Epic. Everybody uses Epic, oh, yeah. and and uh, and and one one Epic instance doesn't talk to another Epic instance. It's just your true. healthcare records aren't portable, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a it's a major issue in the industry. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, that's something I've been living with for for some time now. Now you mentioned uh, you eventually scaled this and sold it, and then you pivoted over to Pictory. Let's let's talk about that transition. You sell. And then why did you pivot over to Pictory? Yeah, so we had a we got we got this business to a nice place where it was uh, I had an entire leadership team set up and uh, and I was just getting bored. It was not it had been doing it for fifteen years and not 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 uh, uh, not enough innovation from for my taste. And uh, um, so I, as we were selling it, I was thinking about okay, what's next? Does um, too young to retire, I felt, and uh, um, and I and, and started thinking about the problems that I'd faced, and one of the problems that I had faced myself, like so unrelated to this data management thing, one of the problems, I, I, be, I had become a thought leader, and I was trying to make a lot of webinars and white papers and, and create a lot of content for for marketing to, to, to use and for salespeople to use, and uh, the thing that we we all have noticed is there's this been the shift of, of content. Um, a content has exploded. There has been like obviously a lot more written content, but then what people like to consume now is podcasts and videos and and different types of content. And um, and you and I are comfortable in getting in front of the camera to create a video and and uh, and distribute it to our audience. But most people in an organization weren't. And, and then further, even if you were comfortable in getting in front of the camera, editing those videos was is painful. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have editors who spend a bunch of time and, and uh, to, to edit this podcast out. But so we, we found both those problems. I, 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 I realized that, you know, hey, video is going to be something that we're all going to use in the future. We're all going to, it's become, it's going to become the standard form of communication, but very few people are empowered or know how to create or edit videos. Um, so in our 350 or person organization, we had one video person, that's it. And everybody would be lining up to her and like, I need help with my product video or my sales video or my HR video or my uh, marketing video. And, and it was like, you know, if there is one problem I would like to focus on is that because we saw like all the stuff that early days of AI and transformers were coming out. We saw what Canva was doing around um, design and making design really easy. And I was like, okay, I, I think I know I, what I want to do. I want to make Canva for video. Um, and that was kind of the story and, and with a lot of AI in the, in the mix. Um, so that's kind of how we came about this problem. And it's unrelated to, to, data management and SAP and enterprise completely. But um, again, I fell in love with the problem. And I think that's an important thing as an entrepreneur. Yeah, you know, in fact, I think that is, you know, Victor, I think you just unintentionally created the greatest story for people to really grab onto. Um, when you when you when you're working, when you're doing things every day, folks, and you identify a problem out there, like, you know, Victor mentioned that you he saw a line of people lining up, trying to get the video editors time that became an actual problem that could be solvable and profitable done right, right? So you can make a business case for it. Uh, just like we're talking about right now with the EHRs and they're actually individuals currently right now trying to figure out how to solve that issue. Because Victor mentioned, even Epic's EMR instances of Epic, they didn't even talk to each other. It's, it's the same exact electronical medical records, yet it doesn't talk to each other, right? Uh, and I'm sure that's probably done. Uh, for reasons, all right, as well. So, so now let's let's talk about Pictory because I think it, it's really cool what you're doing because you, I think it was a phenomenal job also linking it to Canva. 
everybody I think uses Canva at this point in time, or at least a lot of folks do, at least in the creative world. Uh, it's very easy, very, very user friendly. So talk about like, what does your program do? How does it work? How can people, what's the value for the entrepreneur uh, to use your program? Yeah. So it's really simple. The, the, the first use case that we built it for was text to video. So script to video. A lot of us are good at writing stuff. Now with chat GPT, he's good at writing stuff. And I just take um, <laughs> the output from him and, and put it into Pictory. But but get that, get a script and put it into Pictory and Pictory will convert that to a video. And now the way it works is actually, it's pretty simple. It's not, not magical, but it, it feels like magic when you see it. Um, what it's doing is it's trying to understand what you're trying to say in the script and the story. So that's that's one piece of AI that we've developed. And then based on that understanding, we'll try to find stock content that matches uh, the, the story the best and we try to find multiple pieces of stock videos so not just stock images but stock videos and we stitch them together to tell you the whole story we add captions to them we can add music to that we can also add a narration to that so a text to speech narration that's again third party ai for that uh, but but we put it all together and then and pretty much in a matter of minutes you can have a, a video ready starting from a, from a, from a script. Oh man, folks, if you're watching this on YouTube, which a uh, quick plug for the shades of entrepreneurship, YouTube channel, I am smiling from ear to ear because this is like a game changer. You don't understand how long it takes for video editing. I mean, you're doing, you're putting in the video and then you're cutting the video down and then you're finding background music and then you're actually cutting out and you're putting still images versus video images and you're mushing it all together. And then maybe you put a backdrop behind it, right? With your logo and it takes a lot of time. To be able to have that your fingertip and click a button and, and you have video populated within minutes, within, within a minute, that's, pretty remarkable you know now that's that's kind of where i think for me as an entrepreneur the value comes in my time right nothing is more valuable than our time folks and and when you find tools and softwares like this you use them as much as you possibly can utilize them uh, they're they're built by entrepreneurs who have also had the same issue which i really truly like as well because it seems like this is an issue that you've also had right and you just wanted to solve correct Exactly. Yeah. And that's the best way is to find a problem that you have <laughs> because you you will find a way to solve that problem. And and one other problem that we actually ended up solving, uh, because this was in the middle of the pandemic when we launched the product and everything was going to video. Uh, so we all had video recordings. So what you talked about, like, you know, we're recording this session as a video. You're going to like my wife was a teacher. She was recording her uh, sessions uh, over video. And uh, we, I mean, everybody was struggling with video editing. And um, again, so one of the other things we solved at that point was uh, we, we call it transcript-based video editing. Just make it very easy. So we just transcribe that, show you the text, and then you can just uh, edit the text and it edits the video. So you can delete a section, oh. delete a sentence, delete a word, remove filler words, remove pauses, gaps. So so that's another piece that we, we've added since then. Again, solving problems for, for ourselves in, in the process, building something very interesting. Yeah, you know, one thing I love about being an entrepreneur is, is to, you know, to be honest with you, we're, we're a little selfish because we basically try to solve problems that we have and that we see other people have. And then we try to solve it and like, hey, now that we solved it, let's try to go ahead and make money. But then hey, let's just go ahead and sell it and try something else and try to solve another problem. Because there's, mm -hmm. there's so many other problems that I think we're constantly trying to solve. Now, with that said, what's what's the future look like for Pictory? What's what's the, well, how are, where are you moving forward? What's your plan? Um, so so I, I, first, let's come back to, to what you just said, because that's actually a really interesting thing, because there is a skill set to then saying, okay, we've solved this problem. It's good enough. I found a product market fit. Let's scale it. So that that bit actually is a chasm. A lot of a lot of great solutions kind of fall in that chasm because they can't find either the product market fit or they can't find a way to scale it. So yes, very uh, true. So yeah. Um, anyway, so I think we're past that. We found a product market fit for both our our, our solutions here: video editing, video creation. Um, 
But where we have right now is where it's being solved for is very small businesses. So the prosumers and the small businesses and the very small businesses, they're using our product and, and they're loving it because they don't have the budget to hire agencies to make videos. They don't have, and, and the, the problems are different. Now, when we go talk to the larger companies, when we go talk to the Nikes of the world and the, and the Boeings of the world, they're telling us that their video problems are slightly different. They, they don't have, they have budgets so they can they can spend more money. Right, right. They have a lot of content that they have internally, and they want to leverage some of that content uh, rather than stock content. Their branding requirements are very different from a branding requirement of a of a of a very small startup. So so they are like now we're we're trying to think about you know how can we take this up market? How can, how can we make this product up market? The other things that that people are telling us again, it's part of it is discovering from customers part of it is again solving that problem for yourself and having the vision but one of the things that people are telling us is how do you know that this video is going to perform well on youtube mm, yeah yeah um, can you can you predict and uh, and so we have some really good ai people working on that and trying to figure out okay can we can we adv- can we predict in advance of you posting the video that hey this this is going to perform and what can you make to change it what can you do to change it what kind of title description thumbnails you can use that kind of thing so so those are the other things that we're working on nice and you know one of the things I, I really like what you mentioned was product market fit because i think what you just organically said to the folks is hey your product currently fits the small business and entrepreneurs it doesn't fit the enterprise yet so we we have the right product but it's not the right product market fit for this market so that's why you're starting to look at, okay, the enterprise uses, like you're mentioning, you use stock photos. How can we actually import all of these Nike branded photos? Because again, folks, Nike, so if you work for a large organization, you work for any corporation, you're going to have a brand strategy. You're going to have brand guidelines. You're going to have to use certain fonts, certain colors, certain color schemes, right? And and our, the brands, especially like Nike, I mean, truly Nike doesn't make anything, right? Nike is a brand, uh, everything that is made for Nike and they put their logo on it. And so their brand is really everything, right? And so that's that's really interesting um, seeing. And that's another thing folks had to kind of understand like, hey, your, your solution might be great for a small set of market, but if you actually tweak it a little bit, you might have that vertical integration to go into a new market to kind of continue to scale simply because you tweaked a few things and you identified. And now one of the things you also mentioned, Victor, is talking to folks and the information you receive back. How do you go out and receive information back about your product? How do you get feedback? Yeah, so you have to put various mechanisms in place and as, as you're growing. Uh, when you're small, you just pick up the phone and try to have as many conversations as possible with, with customers or potential customers. However, that doesn't scale when you have, like we have 20, over 20,000 customers, paying customers. It's not easy to pick up the phone and talk to all of them. So so we have a community site where a lot of people will interact, tell us uh, what what they're facing, what, what are some of the challenges. We solicit feedback from them. Um, we put out a roadmap publicly where uh, on our website, so people can w- vote on features that they're looking for uh, or add new features that they want to see in the product. Right. Um, awesome. So, so, so various ways through support channel. Support is our front line. They're constantly talking to customers. And so they, they share some of the feedback um, with the product team and, and everybody else. So and salespeople. So it's like you have to find various ways, but that's an important part of being an entrepreneur is actually to be in touch with your with your users because things change. I mean, market conditions change, yep. new things come out and, and you wanna make sure that you're on top of it. That's very, very true. That's really good advice. In fact, that's very good advice for those users thinking about it. But what, what advice would you have for aspiring entrepreneurs that are just starting their journey? Maybe some things that you wish you knew, things you know today that you wish you would have known when you started. Um, so I'll give you a few things. So I, I sometimes teach an entrepreneurship class at the UW here, and I'll talk of, about a few things that I'll just I'll, I'll mention it here uh, because I think I think it's important. Um, great products are not built in the lab; they're built in the market. So that's one that's really important because you can continue to ideate and 
and build, 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 and and prototype, prototype, prototype. But unless somebody sees it and and buys it, more importantly, gives you their credit card or or cash, that you haven't validated it. No matter how, like even and and this even now I I see it like I have I can tell people that this is what I'm building, even show them a demo, and they'll say this is cool, this is good. They're just responding to what what you want to hear. But uh, but until they've actually made the the purchase, you don't know that it's it's real. So so that's one really important um, advice that that I would give is just get it out there, take the lean lean startup approach, get the product out, get an MVP out, uh, minimum viable product, get it out, get it in front of the customers, and and I think that's I think that's the most important. There's many other things, but that's probably the most important thing. You know, folks, I hope you're starting to hear a trend on this podcast, uh, minimal vile product, product market fit, network, network like hell, right? Get out there and meet with folks, uh, tell them about your product, tell them about your ideas, share your thoughts and ideas. And people, I, I hear a lot of people, well, I don't want to share my thoughts because what if somebody else takes it? If you're not, nobody's going to take your thought and idea because it takes a lot of time and effort to do it. You have to have the passion to do it. If you have the true passion to do it, and even if somebody else does it, do it better. Come out and do it better than them. Right. I mean, it's 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 kind of that kind of now uh, a world. Now, speaking of how can, you have, you know, Pictori, you have all these other things uh, going on. How can folks get in contact with you if they want to learn more about you? They want to maybe connect with you, find more information, uh, learn from you, uh, kind of, you know, how you grew your companies. How can they contact you? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to be a mentor to entrepreneurs. I'm really happy because I've done it multiple times now. And and by the way, I, like, not that I'm an expert because every journey is different. And and as you know as well, uh, being an entrepreneur. So um, LinkedIn is probably the best way. I I, I get, you could reach out to me or Pictory.ai. Just um, look it up. And uh, uh, but yeah, um, LinkedIn is probably the best way to contact me. Perfect. In fact, after this show, we're going to chat because I think uh, I might have a mentoring opportunity for you right now with an entrepreneur here in Oregon who's actually scaling uh, a video app uh, here in Oregon. It's 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 basically like, um, it's kind of like a TikTok, but the videos go away within like a, a week or two. And it's, it's usually only like videos around your community. So, and there's no friends in it. It's just kind of, it's pretty unique. So we'll, we'll touch base with that. So folks, again, if you want this information, this is a good opportunity for you to subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter at the shades of e.com. I will have Victrum's information as well as the links to Pictory. Uh, so you can find that information. Again, I, I, I'm going to totally dive into your thing as well, because it might be very beneficial to the podcast, making podcast editings, uh, things of that nature. Now, Victor, is there anything else you'd like to say before we, we head out? I think the, the thing I love about, we've talked about Nike so many times. And the thing I really love about Nike is their slogan of just do it. And I think it applies to so many things in life, but particularly to entrepreneurship. So a lot of people are on the fence about like, you know, hey, I'm I have this idea. Should I do it? And and you said you said something completely true. Ideas are dime a dozen. They're just not like don't don't protect an idea. Go talk, do it. Doing it is more important. So just do it. That's that's the main. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's don't don't be idea. afraid if people poke holes in your idea. They're they're doing it because they they want to really help you and say, hey, does it truly? is there truly a market for the problem that you're solving? So you have a solution, but is there an actual problem in the market for it, right? So Victrum, thank you again so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Pictory, I'm going to dive into it. Folks listening, you can follow me at theshadesofe.com, or you can also check us out on social media, the Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, LinkedIn, and our new YouTube page. Please check out The Shades of Entrepreneurship. You can also uh, support the show by visiting Patreon, The Shades of E. Again, that's $5 a month to support the show. Thank you and have a great night.